should now be able to see it. So yeah, welcome to this session that we've called uh, Building an Open Science Alliance, how Utopia 2050 and Utopia Train support open research. So it's about um, presenting uh, what we do in open science in the two Utopia projects. Um, hello, everyone who is online and also who is in, in Barcelona physically and maybe joining this one. And uh, maybe also to new participants of the Utop or to new members of the new Utopia universities. Um, now, maybe formally, you can use the chat if you like to say hi, to ask questions. Um, it's recorded as well, so just be aware of that. And let's jump to the agenda, I would say. Now, if this moves to the next slide. So today, uh, we have essentially two objectives, and you see this in the agenda. One is that we really inform you about what is happening in regard to open science. In Utopia, this is done by Enrique Valduri and, and me um, from the, the side of the Utopia Alliance. And then also uh, in the second, let's say this, the second presentation is more about to learn more about the situation of open science at uh, universities in Europe more widely and maybe how universities can do more to support open science or if they should do more in some areas. And this is a presentation by Vincian Gaillard uh, who will just follow um, after our beginning uh, presentations. And in the end, of course, there's this time for discussion and also Q&A. It's a one hour session, so it's very short um, though. Um, Enrique, do you want to add something here? Maybe yes, you're one of the organizers too. Well. Uh, um... Well, you're the main organizer, but thank you very much. Uh, no, uh, just a couple of things. Yes, you said that, but let me uh, emphasize that. Welcome to everyone, of course, but also to the people from the new members of the Alliance. Uh, I saw that some people connected, at least from Nova and Kafoskari, and um, probably someone else from other institutions, but that's great. And um, second of all, for those of you who are here in Barcelona, I apologize for the weather. Um, we We... We, we basically, it didn't work out. We, uh, we asked for nice weather, which is what we normally have. And this week it's just turned out to have a, uh, a very awful, uh, well, not a very awful uh, uh, weather condition, but you know, windy and rainy and gray. But anyway, uh, it's, part of it's part of Europe and part of Utopia too. Uh, thanks, Lena. Yeah, great, thank you. So. Uh... Now this is covered. I think we can start with a more of a yeah, the broader introduction about open science. And probably many of you have uh, have th seen this in in one way or another. But if you're especially if you're new to it, then let's just uh, let's just say a few words about what is open science or what what is covered by open science better here. So we don't have a, I think we don't have a very specific definition in the project. But let's just say that open science is let's say the the combination of different, uh, or the, the, the objective is to make essentially research activities and their outputs more accessible, more transparent, more open to society and uh, to stakeholders, and certainly also reproducible. Um, and okay, many of those, we can probably add a few things there as well, but I think this is the, this is the essence of it. And just to, to highlight this, uh, UNESCO has just last week adopted a recommendation on open science. And you can see uh, from the documents that they used in the process that um, many different types of activities fall under open science. So for example, on this slide, you see on the left more steps in the research life cycle from hypothesis uh, generation to data collection, to peer review, to publication and use of data and outputs where you can kind of introduce more openness uh, or you can increase openness, let's say incrementally, or like as a whole at these different steps in the process. But there are also different kind of, let's say activities in general, where that are shown more on the right, let's say this is more of a typology of open science activities according to UNESCO. And you can see some very prominent ones like the open access to publications, for instance, open and fair data is one, and citizen science is also mentioned here. And then some other related topics such as open innovations or open evaluation, open source, which are certainly related to open science, can also be in a, in a more, let's say, a more, more like say maximal view of open science can also be considered at, as these activities or open educational resources, for example, are a good um, connection to also education and, and, and training where open science also overlaps with that. So this just as a very broad background into open science. Um, 
for those of you who are not really aware of this. And if you have questions, then just put them in the chat if we can uh, explain a little bit more about those. That's certainly possible. Now, very broadly to say what, uh, what Utopia is doing, and I've just taken this as an example from the Utopia train, uh, project descriptions is essentially saying that uh, we are committed to, to open, open science and open access um, as, a, as an alliance, and there are different activities that we will present later. And I think this, this sentence from Utopia Train really encapsulates that pretty nicely, but we actually, the project description says that research shall not be closed behind walls, but accessible to all and really benefit more actors uh, or as many people and uh, different stakeholders as well with a little restriction as is, um, as is possible or let's say as is necessary. Um, now, what does that mean technically? Um, Open science does not just come from it, you know, it does not, does not just pop up, but it needs some institutional action and concerted, um, like say, activities within universities and other research organizations. So just to, to highlight this here, that in the end, open science, as many other uh, activities in universities does need, uh, it needs certain policies that streamline uh, activities that write down expectations, that write down responsibilities of different actors, you need a certain infrastructure, for example, for sharing of publications and data, or also for analysis and of research data during the project for using certain types of software, you might need a certain infrastructure. You need certainly training and guidance of specific, let's say the, the skills that researchers and the other staff that works on open science should develop during um, during their careers to support open science and at the core there's certainly also something about coordinating all this so that it all um, fits together and this is just a nice um, framework to to structure like the thinking about open science a little bit also about um, within utopia and the different projects we have used this um, first of all to map the kinds of things that we do within the two projects. And so keep this in mind. I think this is a really good or a helpful frame to, to think about how to advance open science, at least at the institution in order to be active. So we have mapped this. And I think Enrique, if you agree to say a few words about this, this one, if you, if you would like to take over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, basically, yes. Thank you very much. No. And um, this is just, um, uh, I don't know, a, a map, a presentation of uh, the different uh, things that are being done, done within the Utopia 2050 and in Utopia train projects, and also the Utopia CIF initiative, which is a, a co-fund scheme for postdoctoral fellows within the Marie Curie um, program um, that um, the six original universities in Utopia um, applied for and successfully obtained. So uh, this is just basically to get you a, um, an overview of the kind of things. We're going to be looking into them in detail in the next couple of slides. But the emphasis here is that there are a lot of things that can be done, as, as was obvious from the very first slide that Leonard discussed, um, that have to do with things like training and guidance policies and infrastructure. and. Um, Within these projects, we have particular uh, milestones and particular goals that uh, have to be reached. And perhaps, uh, and uh, uh, th th this is not exhaustive, of course. Um, uh, perhaps add that uh, a lot of a lot more things could be done. Perhaps um, new ideas will come out uh, uh, from uh, you know the talk that we're going to have right after this overall presentation, or from discussion that we're going to have after that. And uh, it's it's open ended. Um, and uh, Leonard, should we progress to the next slide, maybe? Yeah. Um, let me uh, just talk briefly about the Utopia 2050 project uh, very quickly. Uh, Utopia 2050 predates Utopia Train. It's, a, it's an Erasmus Plus project. The emphasis is university-wide, so it encompasses um, every uh, aspect of university life. And in fact, research came into Utopia 2050 uh, only um, not at the last time, but um, a bit not illegally uh, in the sense that uh, the, the Utopia project, 2050 project was not to, supposed to be a project about research. 
it could include issues of research coordination and planning and policy, but not really research. Utopia Train is a research project, part of the Horizon 2020 um, framework program, and therefore it's more focused. And in that sense, the, what, what the activities in Utopia 2050 are preliminary to what we may want to do in, in, um, in uh, train. Um, just before we go into the details of, of the slide, um, openness, uh, as Leonard was saying, is very important in, in Utopia. And uh, believe it or not, Utopia is an acronym. And uh, the O and the P belong to the word open. So, you know, there's two, three, four, five, six, two out of seven letters that have to do with uh, openness. Okay, so um, that's just a, a curiosity, but it's worth uh, noticing. Anyway, uh, there are basically three main foci, three main areas, three main blocks within the Utopia 2050 project. Uh, one is sort of like the outlining of um, uh, what we envision as a future open science office for Utopia. Um, and basically, um, we are working on obtaining best practices from what we consider to be the leading uh, universities or research centers in Europe in this domain. Uh, we're going to have a workshop in February where we that's going to be discussed. And um, we, we hope that that will uh, set the basis of what we can do uh, from then on, and uh, you know, with the eyes put in 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 the mid to, in the midterm, not not immediately by the end of the Utopia 2050 project, which is already in November 2022. Okay, then we have a, a blog which is called um, uh, "Building Utopia's Capacity," and here we're basically uh, working on um, uh, putting into writing what we think would be an ideal model. Uh, policy for utopia institutions um, as a, you know, again, mid to long term goal. And basically, the short term goal would be that each institution there would make a commitment to how far they're willing to go towards that model and at what pace. Um, and finally, uh, to basically put together uh, a list of online open resources um, uh, that have to do with training in different aspects of open science, put that together in a utopia guide, um, not to develop uh, our own uh, resources, that's part of uh, utopia train, and um, start identifying um, uh, what would be training goals um, in a preliminary fashion uh, for the consortium and maybe materialize that through some kind of utopia branding, right? A visa or a passport. Um, and uh, finally, we have this uh, other blog, which is more of a, an engagement kind of activity and also putting together research with um, um, cultural aspects of university life, where um, uh, these exhibitions are being put together, both physically, physical exhibits and online virtual exhibits, uh, where uh, art students are going to be um, rendering particular research projects, three from each university, into um, a language which is not the usual language of uh, researchers, but uh, the language of art and culture, and um, uh, have that be available to the wider community. And of course, we expect a whole range of agents to be involved with each one of these uh, activities and outputs uh, from the, um, the more internal to the uh, wider um, co uh, uh, community external to the university. Well, back to you, Leonard. If if you think that's okay. Yeah, I think that was that was a good overview over what uh, what is being done there. Now, um, for Utopia Train, uh, which is where the VUB where I'm working is, is at least coordinating this this activity. Um, we've kind of you can see that it builds on a, a little bit of the the activities that were actually prepared in the Utopia 2050. And here it's it's divided into four specific uh, areas of action, and I think they are relatively discrete. So it's, it's helpful to, to know what the plans are there. So also for those who are not maybe too much aware of Utopia Train, this is a project that runs for three years. Um, and as, as Enrique mentioned, is funded by uh, the Horizon 2020 uh, program. And it started in January of this year and it runs then until December 2023. So we have uh, still around two years left um, to achieve 
um, the goals of the project and some of the tasks uh, of the project also they end um, around mid 2023 so there's still some time uh, left to <laughs> to for us to to work on now we have really as i, as I said built on these uh, actions done from the utopia 2050 so the first task is really about um, training and, and and let's say skills development so we have a specific task that um is uh, is developing uh, training material or courses that we would like to um, give to researchers or data stewards which have been identified in the project so we had for example a webinar last month on open science which was a bit more broad but we will probably do a few more more targeted uh, webinars as training uh, moments we will develop some guidance documents for example we are working on something for horizon europe and the open science requirements there which should be very handy for the members or researchers at the different members um, um, across i think all the well the 10 partners now then the second one that is a bit more about the discovery of actual open access outputs so there we are working together with the, the libraries in particular on developing let's say a search uh, portal a catalog of the various publications uh, that are stored in particular in the repositories of the partners. So this is about the discovery and the highlighting of the open access publishing at the different um, partners. So this will also be um, developed mainly during next year, it should be final. Um, we have a third talk and that is certainly a more cross-cutting one because it's one of that, the one that specifically enables a lot of open science um, activities. It's about um, a policy that in particular looks into incentives and rewards in research and specifically on open science. So there are questions about how do we incentivize and reward open science publishing, data sharing, etc. And we will start this also with um, with a workshop uh, next year that is open for I think, everybody who's involved in the utopia universities in particular the six partners of the utopia train projects but um, since the policy is all probably also interesting for the other partners i think this is also a good opportunity to be involved and make sure that their input is also heard um, in these, um, these these kind of outputs because in the end there's a certain expectation to align across the alliance uh, on these so we definitely invite you to um, to save the date for this one um, when the registrations they will probably open as well uh, later well, at the end of maybe next week and there the objective is to come up with like also an overarching um, framework policy so um, again it's not let's say a uh, um, a template that everybody needs to strictly follow, but more about aligning the dimensions, for example, for research assessment and certain, let's say, methods and tools that at least are, let's say, recognized uh, across Utopia. Um, and this is a, let's say, one year um, activity, certainly. So this is not something that uh, will be done very, uh, very quickly because it needs a lot of consideration and discussion. And finally, we have one that is in particular about citizen science. There we have um, main activity is actually building a community of practice of researchers who are active in this area. So if you have anyone who's doing citizen science projects, you can certainly get in touch with us and we would welcome them to the next meetings um, of this community. They will get one so far and we are planning the next one. And there will also be um, training materials and peer learning sessions on, on citizen science and from the researcher side, maybe also from the support side. Um, in this area and there there's also a workshop planned for february together with uh, unica which is another alliance of universities um that well not not a university alliance but an association of universities in different countries so this is also to to make sure that um, this is a very broad um, activity where people can benefit from across the board now this is it for utopia train we uh, wanted to keep this part this presentation very short this is just in a nutshell <laughs> Um, to say that, um, yeah, you can contact uh, us too here. Um, if you have any questions about the specific activities, we are announcing the events through the various Utopia channels that are there, the website, the, the mailings that you might get uh, from the newsletters, etc. We have a few activities coming up and you should save the date if you want to participate, the opening of the registrations, etc will be happening very shortly so in, within the next few weeks uh, you will be able to sign up uh, for these different activities um, and i would leave it at here um, and thank everybody for listening to this 
part, if the slide moves on. Um, Enrique, I don't know if you want to say something on top of that. No, you, you did a beautiful job, Leonard. Uh, yeah, just emphasize the fact that uh, all of these activities are meant for the entire Utopia community, and that means now uh, uh, 10, 10 institutions. So, you know, all, I think they are all um, very interesting in terms of content and the kind of uh, experiences that people share in them. So everybody is very welcome, as Leonard said. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I stop sharing and we have our speaker um, should be joining at least visually very shortly. That's Vincent Gaillard. He's, she's the deputy director for research and innovation at the European University Association. So certainly an organization that um, many of you who work in open science will at least have heard of. And they have done a very interesting study recently on the situation of open science uh, at universities which is just on the screen. So Vincian, if you want to take over, I leave the introduction at this and everything you, you say, I think that will, uh, is, is uh, in your, in your uh, let's say on, on your pitch now. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lennart. And thank you all. Good afternoon, all. I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I would like to thank um, Lennart, especially for this kind of invitation. Um, you may know that Leonard uh, is a former colleague of mine uh, from, from EUA, and I have to thank him also because he contributed also to the ideation process that led to this um, survey and the survey report I will um, focus on now. Um, okay, let me get into uh, it right away. The first thing that I wanted to, to say is a few words about EUA in case you don't know what EUA is about. So we are the European University Association. We are the voice of, Euro of uh, universities in Europe with uh, 840 members from uh, 48 countries. So as you can see, it's not just the European Union, it goes beyond uh, the European Union. And I have counted that um, about yeah, two thirds of the alliance uh, the, the partners in the alliance are members of EUA. If you're not yet, uh, please consider. This is a very important uh, association to, to join. Um, well, that's it now with the self-promotion. Let's get into this. And here you go. And I will go very quickly on this because, Lennart, you mentioned it already. So again, um, the UNESCO um, recommendation on open science is a very, it's a, it's, it's a good framework to reflect upon about open science. And here I copied the definition uh, of, of the UNESCO declaration, the UNESCO recommendation. So you see that really open science is, is something very broad. Um, keywords are, it's about inclusion. It's about um, not just the results of, of um, the scientific, a process, but it's the process itself. Multilingualism is very important there. And obviously it's uh, the main focus is to be openly available, accessible and reusable. And that's not just for researchers or for some, it's for everyone. It's for the benefit of society. So I leave it uh, like uh, um, here on the definition, but I wanted just to mention and to highlight that this is our, in the context of EUA, this is how we understand open science. Um, in that context, also, it's important to mention um, our key priorities uh, within EUA. And again, you mentioned that already, uh, Lennart, earlier on. Um, open science can be considered as um, the dimensions in the, the process, the research process, but also the very different dimensions that are, um, that are means to make things open. And um, I will get to that uh, with the results of this open science survey. Um, I wanted to focus on our key priorities in open science. And before I go, I cite them to highlight the fact that we really have, and uh, we strive to have a 360 uh, degree perspective on open science, a very holistic and comprehensive approach to open science. So here you have some of them listed uh, because 
for the sake of readability and visibility, we have to at some point isolate them. But of course, by no means we want to, we mean to uh, take them in isolation. They are interconnected. So um, one of them, and that's the kind of the historical one is the open access. Um, so promoting open access policies to research publications and then data came on um, in addition, achieving, and that's related to the publication and the scholarly publication system, achieving a more transparent and a more sustainable, equitable even um, scholarly publishing system. Another one is contributing to the development and implementation of research data management, data sharing, and that is in the context uh, of the European Open Science Cloud. And then, um, and you mentioned that again, uh, Leonard, because this is important in the Utopia uh, train uh, project. It's about raising awareness and supporting universities in reviewing, revising, reforming, uh, depending on how you see this, their approach to academic career assessment. So this is where we are now at EUA, and I will have to tell you that within the next few months, and that is early 2022, we will launch a new agenda for open science for EUA to lead the main priorities for EUA for the next three years, 2022-2025. So stay tuned, we will, we will, uh, you will hear more. And I will also just um, uncover and unveil the fact that there will be no big surprise there. So those priorities that you see now will still be um, around uh, in this agenda for 2022-2025. Okay, now on to uh, the, the survey. So in the context of those priorities, EUA has managed to gather um, a vast um, and a robust set of data from our members uh, through um, quasi uh, yearly surveys on open science. And uh, the first one dates back to 20, uh, 2014 um, with uh, a focus initially, as I said, on open access to research publications and all the way to the last one, which is the focus of my presentation. So it dates back, the, the data uh, collection was just a year ago we started somewhere in November uh, 2020 until um, January 2021. And the focus was on the idea was to decide um, to explore the difference between principles and practices in terms of open science in Europe's universities. You see that we collected 272 responses not just from EUA members, uh, um, good to mention that, from 36 countries. And again, the objective here was really um, to um, check and explore uh, this, the idea uh, of, is there any difference? Do we find any gaps between strategic importance that is given or allocated at well, leadership level uh, to open science and how this is implemented on the ground uh, in universities. Um, there could be some, some gaps where, for instance, it's very easy, it's rather easy to sign the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, the DORA, um, but it's, it's something totally different to actually do it um, in your university. So what we wanted to, uh, to investigate whether there were gaps and if we, there were gaps, identify the array, uh, the dimensions of open science where you have like a bigger gap. And of, of course, all this with a view to improving the, our understanding of the opportunities, the challenges and the hurdles for you, uh, institutions in order for us as an umbrella organization to be um, in a better place to help our and support our members in this. Okay, the results now. The first one is um, whether um, it's important, whether there is a, um, um, according to the survey respondents, is there an importance, uh, is open science important uh, at a strategic level? And if you count uh, the ones that said it's uh, very, uh, assigned a very high importance and the ones that said that it's highly important, you have over half, so you have um, just under 60% of the respondents saying that, um, open science is of uh, is very high uh, is very highly important or highly important. Do they have a, a open science policy? Uh, yes, for um, 45, uh, 55%, 54% uh, of uh, the respondents, um, and 37, like the additional 37% are in the process of developing one, which is good as well. 
Now, we were talking about those different areas or dimensions of open science. And on this chart, please bear with me, I'll guide you through this. So let's imagine it's, well, we can say it's a spider web or a radar chart. You have uh, the different dimensions that we investigated here specifically. From the top, you have the open access to research publications. Towards the right side, you have everything related to data. Then you have the ones that are less, that are emerging and less developed. Uh, you, we will see that. So everything related to open research protocols, to open education, evaluation, citizen science. And we go back to uh, science outreach and communication that we considered as one of the dimensions of open science. Some may say that this is, this is broader than open science. It is indeed part of research and innovation um, in general. Um, you see that we have different levels from one up to six, and those levels represent, so these uh, represent mean values as to the assignment of the more or less the, the high or less um, uh, lower level of importance and level of implementation that was assigned by respondents to those different dimensions. So in the dark blue, you have the level, uh, the light blue, you have the level of importance, strategic importance, and the dark blue, you have the level of implementation. From the, uh, the top, you see that you have, uh, and that's no surprise, let's say, uh, because again, it's an historic uh, uh, one, open access to research publications is the most um, important. So it has been rated by 90% of our respondents highly, either highly or um, high or very high level of importance. And the same ones regarding to this one, this, this dimension rated, it's, it was about 60% of them said that it was um, important or highly important in terms of the level of implementation. So you see that it's very important and you see that there is not so much of a difference between the level of implementation and the level of importance. Same goes for the science outreach and communication. So it's both highly important and quite um, uh, fairly uh, good level of implementation. Now, everything related to data, there you see that um, the level of importance um, is lower. It's still quite high, but it's lower than the one on, um, on research to open access to research publications, for instance. But then what's really important, and you see, you see there an implementation gap, meaning that the, um, the distance between those two, um, uh, the dots, is higher for everything related to data. So it means that it's gaining traction in terms of importance at strategic level, but in terms of implementation, there is still uh, much to be done. And then the other ones are the ones that we called emerging areas or emerging dimensions of open science. Um, and then you see that, well, it's very clear that the levels of importance are lower and so are the levels of implementation. So here, I wouldn't say there is an implementation gap. The gap, if, the, if we talk about the gap, would be at the policy level. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that was, that was I think, well, to, to us, that was a very important result from our, from our survey. Now, I will turn to uh, something that Lennart wanted uh, me to, to address here. It's the level of engagement and practice. Um, uh, of different um, categories of, of uh, community members within the university um, in, across those different dimensions. I will guide you through this one um, with more details because the other ones you will see are exactly the same. So once you get the, the ID, you get it for all of them. So basically what you have is we asked our respondents to um, um, tell us their perception of the level of engagement and the level of practice of um, different groups, so institutional leaders, uh, librarians, early stage researchers, researchers, research support staff and students, with a, a very first um, a note of caution that I should mention. It was the, our respondents' um, perceptions. Our respondents were mostly uh, open science advisors, librarians, uh, people like research support staffs, or sometimes even leaders in the context of research and innovation or in the context more specifically of open science. So it means that they may have had some disconnection with the student body. Um, so the, 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 what we see with the, the, the students here should be taken with, with caution here. Uh, it was not students 
asked about their own um, peers. Okay. So here the focus is on the level of engagement and practice on open access to research publications. Overall, what you can see, it's quite high in general across the different categories. What you see also is overall among, if you check and you compare the different categories, the level of engagement and practice is higher for leaders and librarians, okay? Could be no surprise uh, to many of you. Um, and then you will see that um, this is, uh, if you remember this uh, spider web chart or the reader chart from before, this is very coherent with the fact that open access to research publication is very uh, important and uh, received quite high level of implementation. Same goes here. Again, as I said, the same. Overall, the, there are higher levels of uh, engagement um, assigned to um, leaders and librarians. But again, across the different categories, we see that science outreach and communication, there is a lot of blue there. And then for the other um, dimensions, you will see that the level of gray, which is like low, very low, or I don't know, uh, levels of engagement, that will increase. So now we are still in something that is, blue is, is okay still, uh, because it's the dimension about data sharing and fair data. But then we turn to, um, this one, which is um, um, citizen science um, on the top and open education um, at the bottom of this one. You have this one, which is about co-creation platforms at the top and open peer review at the bottom. And so you, you get a sense of, okay, again, overall higher levels of engagement for institutional leaders and librarians. A word of caution for the students, because that, that may have uh, been biased by the profile of our respondents, and um, a level of engagement and practice that is quite coherent and consistent with what we have seen with this um, spider web chart. Okay, now I'll focus on um, open access to research publication, which is something that uh, may be of interest to you. So we asked our um, respondents whether their institution was getting prepared for the implementation of Plan S at institutional level. And here, um, we um, the results were not so good, I have to say, overall. And then we decided we would check whether there would be a difference according to whether the, res the National Research Agency is a signatory and, a, and supports uh, Plan S or not. And you can see that the difference is striking. So. Uh, among the, the, the countries where the main research funders have signed Plan S, you have a vast majority, 68% of our respondents said they are getting prepared for it. And only 17% say they are not. On the contrary, for countries where the main research funders have not signed, you have the uh, min minorities where you have 24% not getting prepared and you add to that another 24% who don't know. So this is not good either not to know. And 51% are, do know that they are not getting prepared. Okay. So basically you have a significant difference between, the, between those, those pattern, the, the pattern of results here. And so in overall, in some, that means that the preparation for Plan S mainly depends on whether a country has become a signatory of Plan S or not. I checked, obviously, uh, for your uh, alliance. And so um, we have um, Portugal with FCT. We have um, Slovenia with ARRS. We have the INR for France. And you, we have UKRI. So those ones have signed Plan S. So in those countries, from the Utopia Alliance, you would expect that um, those universities would, would be towards like the, the first category of universities and the other ones maybe, uh, I don't um, hope that it is the case, but they may fall into the second category. It is um, worth noting that some institutions are nevertheless getting prepared um, and they are implementing change in lines with um, Plan S specifications without or like on a voluntary basis. And it's even more important to mention and to bear in mind that all researchers receiving funding from Horizon Europe will need to comply with Plan S. And that is irrespective of whether or not the national research, research funder becomes a signatory of Plan S. So this is very important for you, for your alliance, for your researchers to bear that in mind. Okay. 
I'll skip this one. We, we can get to this one if you want, and you will get the slides if you want them. It's about the open access targets and monitoring me mechanisms. And then here, I wanted to focus on research data as well. So here you see a, an overly um, a, a good uh, landscape here. So we asked whether uh, universities were um, having um, provisions, uh, infrastructure provisions for data storage, for data repository, and for data management plan tools. And um, we specified whether it was internal, external, shared, or a combination. Overall, and up to the light gray, it's good. It's, it means that there is something. And you see that the proportion is quite high, up 80% for data storage, a bit less for data repository, and about 70% overall uh, related to the DMP tool, which is good. Now, again, about data, it's about the provision for research data skills at the institution. And here, well, the landscape, it's not so, it's not so bright. So we asked um, to separate per category of staff. So the technical staff, the researchers, and, and whether they had the, the, the skills in data management, in e-infrastructures and so on, you can read this. Um, what you see is that you have over 50% of the surveyed institutions reported that research data skills were only partially available. Um, so that is, that is, yeah, that's kind of 50%. And all of the ones that said that it was not available or partially available were um, agreed on the fact that it's needed. So more of these skills are needed at institutional level. So there is room for improvement there and there is a need uh, from the, the survey respondents. I'll skip the next one on the future involvement in EOSC. I can get there if you want me to, but then I wanted to focus on this one. So this one is on, um, so we asked whether or not the, um, the respondents, um, whether they included open science practices in the decision-making related to um, career progression or funding allocation. So you have, 34.4% then um, said that they do not include anything related to open science in their career assessment. And among the ones that said, well, we do, um, and that's, uh, I, um, uh, I apologize because it's not do, do that clear, but you have 77% of the ones saying that they do, that focused essentially on um, depositing um, research articles in a repository. So you have 77%, 49% on open access publishing of research articles in open access journals. And then it goes down to the list to um, all other kinds of research outputs and stages in the research process that they are only considered by up to 25%. So you have uh, citizen science, you have data sharing, you have... Um, co-design of research project and so on and so forth, okay? Um, the, on the bright side, uh, we can say that 56% of the survey respondents said that they are willing or that they, they are planning to expand the range of open science activities that will be considered in the future. So that is, that is good. And now I turn to the main conclusions of this um, survey. So first of all, as you see, open science is seen as an important strategic priority, but there is an implementation gap in a way. Um, and this, uh, the gap, well, depends on the um, dimensions, the different dimensions of open science. Uh, there is a note because we've discussed this internally already at EUA. Um, there is really a um, kind of, it's a level playing field that is unequal and unfair. Um, so you have different institutional awareness timelines and a different context uh, at national and European um, um, level of the different areas. So for instance, now citizen science seems to uh, be more and more important, but it's, it's rather recent. So we'll see if that um, kind of gives um, an impetus to improve this there. Um, there was a, a, gr a great, a good agreement on the fact that uh, the needs, uh, there is more need for more skills related to, um, well, data related areas. And there is a limited co consideration of open science in academic assessment. Now, 
we have three main conclusions uh, and, and well recommendations uh, from this report. First one is to create the conditions. Um, yeah, and I should mention that those recommendations are for institutions, obviously, but also for re individual researchers, research funders, and policymakers. So it's about uh, the idea is to create the conditions to mainstream open science, to fully integrate open science in reward and incentive practices, and to continue to invest in embedding, ben, embedding open science in institutional policies and practices. And if I have like one more minute, um, we have a follow-up report uh, that is being prepared now specifically on open access to research publications. And from this one, we have additional um, specific recommendations. Institutions should invest in creating conditions for monitoring open access activities. Uh, universities should make the necessary changes to enable their researchers to comply with Plan S requirements. I mentioned that already. And universities and researchers should consider multiple paths to publishing open access. So there are many ways uh, that you can you can be open access. Um, and this is this does not um, it's not limited to paying an additional uh, article processing charge to have your uh, paper uh, made open access. I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any question you may have. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marcian. I think that was very comprehensive and certainly from my experience, some of the findings also resonate with what I have heard and seen from other partners in Utopia about the, the challenge to implement open science and open access. I mean, institutions and uh, the need to increase the skills and the knowledge and the capacity to, to really work on that. Um, is there anybody in the audience who has a question? I think we have some 10 minutes left. So is there anybody, and if you can raise your hand, put it in the chat, um, or just start talking, that works too. Um, and there's a Sophia, uh, you want to ask a question, put a comment? Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm from I'm Sofia Miguel from Nova University Lisbon. Um, I have a question about the workshops and the training that uh, probably the project Utopia Train and uh, Utopia 2050 will organize about open sciences. Uh, these uh, workshops and training, uh, now that we are part of this uh, uh, Utopia Alliance, um, we are. Um, we can uh, i assume that we can attend to these um, workshops and uh, and trainings where uh, these trainings are going to be um uh, disseminate it's in the web page of the project it will be on uh, utopia website how will it work thank you yeah just about that i think that's that's very straightforward um so especially the ones that that are like like public that are really like for the entire alliance and not just like let's say the the finishing a certain deliverable of the projects where the new members are not partner this will be announced uh, certainly on the website um which i think is just a uh, relaunch so this is really not nice. <laughs> looks much better <laughs> right now um, than before and also the there are regular newsletters and, and mailings from there but also if you are interested just send send me a message i can put you also on the like the internal contact list that we, we, we used to share um, okay information that's, about open maybe science it's a good activities. option yes yes yeah. because uh, so from what i can saw uh, there are maybe um not only for me but other colleague of mine uh, that maybe it's interested for us to attend to this uh, training or, or workshop yeah thank you yeah. so i just I put them in the chat again as well so you can always contact us. Um, then yeah. the, sometimes it's faster than waiting for the official mailings to to be yeah. okay. directly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just write to the, the two of us. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Enrique. Thank you. Any other question, comment from the audience? There's a lot to digest. <laughs> Doesn't seem so right now. I have something for Vincent, since you mentioned uh, also new strategy and activities from AUA, will there be any opportunities for members to engage in that? Will you support members in bridging this gap uh, between implementation and practice? It could be interesting for Utopia or the individual members. Is there anything maybe on that? Uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's good that you mentioned that. So um, as as the, the survey results made very clear, there is a need to shift. Well, it's not that we have to not to do anything at a policy uh, level, but there is really a need to um, um, work on the on the implementation side uh, and to support the members on this. Um, we have done that already, and you know that very well in the context of the Ferris Fair project, uh, where EU is a, a partner, and that is related to um, fair data management um, and fair data in general. Um, and and uh, we, we felt that um, the activities in that project were very useful uh, to, well, the community, but uh, for what is, is important for EUA, for our members. So indeed, the idea is to um, focus on, refocus our um, priorities and support the members in many different ways. Uh, you know also that we recently published a open access checklist for universities uh, to help them um, making choices in terms of advancing open access at their own level in a non you know prescriptive way but just it's about guidelines and supporting members as to analyzes um, to analyzing also what are the pros and cons of some of those um, pathways to open access. Um, in a very, I think, transparent way. So we did not uh, just uh, obliterate what, what are possible different difficulties in this. So this is um, one step in that context. And then definitely, um, as I mentioned, the, the new agenda for EUA will be, if everything goes according to plan, will be published in February 2022. And the first um, part will be of, of that 2022-2025 um, period will be to prepare a roadmap to implement the agenda and to prepare activities with concrete timelines, expected outcomes. And as I mentioned, yeah, activities could be workshops, could be trainings um, up to a certain level, because you know that as well we will not uh we are not trainers uh so we, we still remain uh, at a um, kind of a generic level at eua so we we have to find the proper uh the right balance and the right position for us to be at the service of the members and to support them but at the same time to not to become a a, tra a training um program let's see Yeah, thank you. That was also very good to hear. Um, any other questions, comments from the audience? Seems very shy. Maybe as everybody is a bit uh, <laughs> uh, maybe tired after lunch or uh, something else. Um, well, then I can also ask questions because we have four minutes left. So, um, so again to Vincent because you are, I mean, or, or Emily, you are unmuting. So if you want to say something, just- Well, actually it's, uh, ah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very PC question or politically correct question. Let me be a, a devil's advocate, but just between, you know, it's just 20, 20, 20 of us now, it's a small <laughs> group. Um, I was wondering with, with this type of questionnaires, I, I think it's great. The results are awesome. And I think it gives you, it gives a very great, a very good map of what's going on in the era of open science. But when people are self-reporting about, uh, you know, how important for them things are, uh, I assume there's a bias that, you know, you have to say yes to some extent, right? So, um, and, and also about the degree of implementation. I, I assume you guys have taken into account that uh, and are aware of what the, uh, you know, the, the margin of error is there or what the, the, um, the possible, impact of that maybe on the results you know it's a very yeah, yeah. it's, no, it's no, out of I, intellectual curiosity you know what i mean yeah yeah it's the self-serving bias uh, or yeah definitely um the i don't remember how the questions were labeled explicitly uh but but it was it they needed to refer to a for instance on the strategic importance uh, they needed to respond based on 
well, is that in the statutes of the university, in the strategic plan of the university, any you know high level strategic documents uh, to guide the university? Um, so that was in terms of the of the uh, strategic importance. In terms of implementation, well, yeah, there you could have a bias uh, that would, um, but then I would say that if there is a bias, I would tend to say that this bias could be the same to, for everyone. Well, we could we could have two ways. One one way of biasing would be to indeed um, self um, increase or like respond to a higher level than it what's the actual uh, level of implementation. Or you could be an open science advisor who desperately wants to have more budgets um, <laughs> and, uh, and resources to work on open science and say, well, let's underestimate the actual level of implementation in order to, well, to, to push for my own uh, agenda, let's say. Um, that we cannot know because indeed on the implementation level, you could not really, well, we have not in, in another way uh, to, 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 to take the, your question, we did not collect the official documents um, and because also the responses are anonymous. So there is no way for us to kind of check the validity of what is there. However, I would say that overall in general at EUA, we run many, many uh, surveys um, to our members and the vast majority uh, overall of the of the results we get across the years and not just on open science reflects a very good um, and let's say accurate um, idea of the landscape of what is at stake so yeah more we we cannot do yeah i agree i mean i think it's uh, the, the results are very valid uh, overall because as you say um the the you know if there's a bias it would be similar for for many in the, for most institutions and and the volume also helps you get a clear idea and uh, just to end with a you know a, a comic relief whenever we've answered surveys we tell the truth so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, everybody does the same so yeah thank you very much that was very a very nice talk thank you yeah and it's uh, 3 p.m uh, at least uh, at least here maybe there are some uk partners joining us we're in a different time um, but still, this was also one in hour, Portugal. So we... <laughs> also in Portugal. <laughs> all right, two right, p.m. Right. here. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, but this yeah. is uh, next time it will not happen for sure. Uh, great, thank you very much, uh, everybody, all the participants, the Vincian in particular as the guest speaker, Enrique also as the, the partner in organizing this, and uh, well, the whole UPF team who is running this Utopia Week, uh, online, hybrid, and in person. So I think uh, it was good that. <laughs> All the venues are open, but it must be very exhausting for you. So I hope you you take care for the next couple of days. Still, so see you, everyone. See you. Um, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. See you next time. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.